Today on the Grave Talks, Ghost Doctor, a conversation with Donald Molnar. Who is that brightly lit figure standing down the hall? That was a question that Donald Molnar had to square up as a child. It was the first of many experiences that would haunt Donald throughout his childhood and life, a life that would eventually lead him into the field of medicine, a field that would put him close to death more than he ever thought possible. Today, we discuss his life of ghosts, as well as how he views the paranormal as a doctor. You know, so my uh, interest in paranormal, it started way back when I was a kid. Um, so my earliest memories, um, I remember having... Uh, you know, strange experiences and really not quite understanding it. Um, um, one of the things I always kind of bring up is um, I think I was kindergarten age, five, six, that that age. And I started seeing this um, this figure of light. It was child size. I could see like the head, the shoulders. It was light, but it wasn't too bright to look at. But it was definitely like all light. And it would peek around the corner and look at me. And I'd be like, what? And then sometimes I would see it like run across the, the living room or something like that. And I finally mentioned to my mom, I'm like, mom, I'm seeing this, uh, seeing this like some kind of, it looks like a kid, but it's light. And she's like, what? And uh, she goes, well, that's probably just your guardian angel. So I kind of just chalked it up as my guardian angel. But that's like one of the things that I had. And uh, I remember, you know, way back when, and I think something else that kind of makes me open to the paranormal um, is the idea that my whole family was kind of really into it. Like my mom, she was really uh, into the spiritual side of things. Like her and I, I remember like being in elementary school, we'd have these deep conversations about like God and Jesus and the Bible and things like that. So she was really into the idea of, you know, religion. And she was real open to the idea of like uh, spirits and ESP and psychic abilities and things like that. And then my dad, he was a little less religious and spiritual, but he was more into paranormal stuff like Bigfoot, UFOs, and ghosts. So the reason why I tell you all that is that there was like always an open forum to talk about ghosts in our house. So when stuff would happen, we would all kind of share our experiences. But, you know, jumping backwards uh, to being a kid, I mean, so that kind of seeing that light figure, and then it seems like all of my life, no matter where we lived, and even till now, even to this day, I've always had experiences. And uh, so that's kind of what got me interested into it. And and all that so it's interesting so you had the experience and you had a family that was very accepting of it it wasn't oh you're just having a dream or you're seeing things or it's your imagination they're like no it's probably that <laughs> and well yeah well exactly and and uh, when we get to it you know get out down the line here depending on what we talk about um i mean we co- we would compare notes mm-hmm. i mean there was times where my uh i just i'll just jump ahead and tell you so um i was probably a teenager um high school-ish and uh we lived in another, this was a different house than the house where I lived when I was a little kid and saw the light figure. We had a pool table in this house. It was like a split level house. We had a pool table down in our family room. And um, my dad and I used to play. My dad would, uh, he was a steel worker and he would come home at you know, crazy hours. And he would sometimes wake me up and have him come shoot pool with him and play pool. So there was a couple different nights I remember where um, I would hear the pool balls break. Mm-hmm. It'd be like late at night, like, you know, after midnight that kind of thing. And I hear the, the balls break, like somebody was playing pool. Mm -hmm. So I was like, Oh my God, dad must be playing. So I'd run down there and, you know, and see if he wanted me to play. And, and so I would go downstairs to look and see, and the pool table would be covered up. We kept a cover on the pool table. So there were, the pool table was covered up. The balls were up where on the wall and the rack, nothing, but there was clearly pool balls breaking. So I had that experience happen a couple of nights. And then maybe a week or so down the, down the, down the line from that, my dad's like, Hey, we were sitting around the kitchen table, all of us, and my dad's like, I thought you were shooting pool the other night, Don. It was like, you know, really late in the morning or really late in the evening. I was like, what are you doing? And so he goes, I come down there and he goes, there's nobody shooting pool. <laughs> and, the, and the table was covered and there's balls on the wall. He's like, so is this crazy that he had his own experience totally separate of my experience? And we both kind of thought each other, you know, was playing pool. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff my family kind of experienced. Um 
So yeah, like as a mutual experience, and that's an interesting thing. And I, I want to talk about the just kind of the the sound uh, aspect of of what you guys experience, the audible aspect of hearing the yes. cool balls break. That's I mean, for anyone who who doesn't know, I think almost everyone most would at least know what that sounds like it, from some experience in life, whether you have a pool table or have been around one at some point. It's like bowling right. pins. Those are it's a very distinctive sound when you hear bowling pins going down. That's bowling pins going down. There's nothing else like it. When you hit pool balls, that's pool balls breaking. There's no other sound really quite like it. So, it, it, well, and the other thing too. So, so you'd hear the balls break. Mm-hmm. Then you would actually hear some. Sh- you would hear balls fall in the pockets. So we had that kind yeah. of pool table had individual pockets. Sure. So you know, just like you're saying, when you when the balls break, it had a distinctive sound. Yeah. When the balls fell in the pocket, it also had a distinctive sound. So you would hear the balls break, mm-hmm. and you you'd hear balls fall in the pocket too. It was crazy. Yeah. So anyway, there's so yeah. much very very distinctive sounds with that, and you get to the table, and I guess you would expect, even if no one had been there. In your mind, I'm assuming you're going to go and see, you know, the pool balls on the table or you right. know, in, in places as if they had been in play. That would be what you expect to explain the sound. But when you get exactly. there and they're not in play, they're not in any position for this to have even occurred. What is that? I mean, this is just an, an opinion based question, but it's it's the audible thing is so interesting to me where like it, it, it's similar. Like what people will say, I heard like dishes breaking in the kitchen and they go in there. And in some cases, there's utter chaos and the, the kitchen is, you know, destroyed. In other cases, everything's put away nice and tidy and nothing happened. There was no tornado that went through the kitchen. But yeah. but they hear those things. I mean, what, what do you make of that when you try and, and wrap your mind around that that sort of occurrence happening? You know, it's it's interesting to think about. You know, I don't know if it's is this. You know, is it parallel universes coming together for a period of time, and you know, the sounds that you're hearing are coming from, you know, from a you know a parallel universe or a, you know some kind of dimension that's around us. Mm-hmm. Is there some kind of residual energy? Now, interesting with this pool table was it was a brand new pool table, so you know, it wasn't it wasn't like it was an old pool table in our house that we were living in was, we were the first ones to live in that house. Yeah. So, you know, so sometimes people say, well, there's residuals, yeah. you know, like if you go civil war battlefields, right. You always hear cannon blasts and shots, but there, you don't, there's nobody there to fire the cannon or stuff. So there, you know, so there's some idea that there's this leftover energy, you know, or residual sounds that, that happen. And I'm, it's, curious about where that comes from. If it's just imprinted on the, in the, in the, in the, environment around where all those things happened you know for this particular pool table it's really strange because i don't know why you know it's not like it was an old table and it's an old house and yeah you know so i'm not sure what it's it was almost like a it was almost like a new sound was being projected this projected onto the pool table unless i don't know maybe the energy of me and my dad playing before somehow got stored in the in the in the, in the uh, environment around the pool table and that was replaying itself for some reason but yeah, it's curious to think, you know, when you think about battlefields and and those kind of things, it's like that. It's like residual energy has been stored. Mm-hmm. But it, it is a great question to think. Where does that? But where is it stored, and where does it come from, and why is it on one day and not another day? And yeah. you know, is there is there some kind of is you know is history replaying over and over again? Yeah. And you know, and and it just happens to leak into our world now. I don't know. What are your thoughts on it? Well, I, I guess the assumption would have to to be made of why does residual energy have to come from somebody or something that's dead? Um, and I that's think good point. That, good that's point. that's what I think we've we've always kind of subscribed to for so long. But I would say in the last couple of years of of having conversations on this show, the idea of us and the the easiest way of of putting it is us haunting ourselves. Um, right with with that sort of residual energy that we have created ourselves unknowingly it's not like we have the choice going i'm going to put this energy on here and this is going to happen but just by living our lives and by by having experiences by having moments that are more emotionally charged than others um i I believe that sometimes you know the, the, you have the situation just like this, a house that had not been that old, that no real history of a haunting um, objects that were not old either. Because my one of my initial questions was going to be, is this an old pool table? But obviously not. But no. but well, let me ask you this. And it could be just as simple as, you know, you and your dad 
uh, having those moments together. Obviously, you know, you're a little kid. You're excited to get up. Your dad's like, hey, let's play pool. You know, it's kind of like, you know, we shouldn't be up doing this, but it's our little secret and where this is fun. Um, you know, just kind of those innocent moments you have with your parents. Um, th that's awesome. And, and to you as a kid, that's exciting. And to the parent, you know, it, it, it's even more special because it's you're going you're creating those moments with your kid. So I, I could imagine that that would be an emotionally charged moment even more for your dad than you at those times because he was getting to have those moments and those memories with you. And I'm wondering if that piece of energy right there is what, you know, kind of created that atmosphere for those sounds to be recreated however that works however our energy does what it does if that is simply what that was i mean the other thought would be uh, the question i would ask you know was there anything going on in your life in your household at the time that was fairly dramatic or traumatic or anything like that that you know because those sort of moments can also seem to create imprints in odd ways yeah you know in regards to that question not really no it's just normal stuff you know i was yeah just doing high school. My dad worked and you know, nothing, nothing overly traumatic back then, but yeah, no, it's a good point. I never really thought mm -hmm. about the fact that as living, I mean, it makes sense that we can imprint our energies oh. as we go. It's like, you know, you're so, you're right. So often on, on investigations, we think it's just leftover energy from the, from people that have passed, but, but why couldn't we leave our energy like today? Why can't I leave my energy in a spot? And then it, it replays itself over, over and over again. I think that's possible. And yeah. I think that would explain, you know, cause I, yeah, I don't, you know, it's hard to think that, that, that the pool table was haunted or the house was haunted. Although, you know, we had other experiences in the house, but, but I almost think it's more that what you're saying and what you got to is the idea that we imprinted that emotional energy because it was fun to, you know, the, you know, for both of us to do that. You know, and it wasn't just, you know, my, we, we as a family, we played pool too. Like I have two sisters that are younger than me. So we would have pool table nights, you know, like I remember New Year's Eve was always, uh, you know, my mom and dad never went out, but we, we'd stay in and have like family New Year's Eve night and play pool table, you know, so the pool table had a, a lot of opportunity to, you know, yeah to have an imprint. And then I guess you can, you can even go and argue like, well, you know, the pool table is made out of slate. You know, there's all these different theories about, you know, different rocks and crystals and you know quartz and things like that being able to hold energy so does a slate pool table that you know does it hold energy more than anything else but yeah i think that's actually interesting to think about that it really is i think it's possible it is and i think so many times we're because it it, it does happen with, with trauma but i think it also happens with positive things too like that yeah. you know when, when we we look back on our lives and things and we go back to our memories you know what stands out i mean yes obviously trauma but so do those warm happy memories especially with kids and right. and you're not going to always want to go back especially with kids go back to the trauma you want to try and keep that a fairly happy memory and if that was a positive thing for you and your dad that i think could easily be what's causing it another i mean interesting thing while we're kind of on that subject of of sounds and such something that i've been thinking of a lot lately is you know how there's all these locations now of basically paranormal tourism where you know go to this yes. place because you can rent it out and hunt it and this place and that place that we've seen evolve over the last five ten years oh, and, yeah. and, and so many of those locations keep saying uh, when i talk to them you know we have more activity here now than ever since we started uh yes. you know letting people come in and do it how much of it is the ghost hunters hunting haunting the ghost hunters because people get so excited and amped up to go into all of these locations that they've heard about for so long they've they've studied them they've heard it on our show they've they found out different you know we watched every youtube video about it and they go into this with you know the excitement of a child on christmas morning as an adult and and they experience whatever they experience there and all that energy is being expelled all at one time how much of that is not you know the next group goes in you know next the next week how much of that is simply it's the energy of you know last week's group <laughs> or or whatever group from however far back and it's just this kind of you know everybody's going through and they're making their imprint on it. It's like an Etch-a-Sketch. You know, you play with the Etch-a-Sketch a lot. No matter how much you shake the Etch-a-Sketch, you're still going to kind of see the marks from the last 10 things you drew. Uh, right. You know, is that kind of what is going on in a lot of these haunted locations? Not necessarily the depths of what initially everyone was interested in, 
uh, in terms of its being a haunted place, but more so uh, it being the living, haunting the living. I think it's I think it's highly possible and it actually makes a lot of sense because I actually thinking of a place now close. So I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, but there's this place in Gordonsville, Virginia. It's called the Exchange uh, Civil War Hotel Museum. And I started um, <clears throat> when I first started uh, doing investigations, I started out with the, with the team and we used to go there all the time. Like this is back around 2012 or so. And it was active. But I remember kind of walking away from there thinking, I don't know. I don't think there's much here. But now when you go back there, it's crazy. I mean, it's cr every everything, every room you catch something, every floor there's like three floors to the main building. And it's really it's actually a really cool place to go. Just historically, they have all this Civil War um, member memorabilia and all these other things. And but it's it's so active now. It's when I think back to when I first investigated there to now, it's like almost a the activity is just off the wall. But you're right. And there's and they do a lot of events there. They also do historical tours. So, you know, people may, you know, imprint their energy from just doing a historical tour. And, you know, those, it's, it, it is cool to think. And it yeah. would help explain why. Because I, I don't know how many times I've said that about Gordonsville, the exchange place. I'm like, man, the activity is crazy now, <laughs> you yeah. know. And and who knows what else you're bringing in, you know. Because we, we often talk, too, about, you know, you know, do you bring your own spirits? Do spirits follow you? And mm -hmm. can they follow you into a place? So besides just your energy... Is there is there is there possible that that if you have ghosts hanging along with you, do they go to those places, or yeah. do you invite something into a location? But yeah, I think it's I think it actually explains a lot, and I think it's possible. You know, if we if we believe that if we accept the idea that we're able to imprint energy, you know, on a location that that stays in a location like that, mm -hmm. I think it's it makes a lot of sense because you do. I know on the ghost line, we were um, I was helping out a. Uh, I did an investigation a couple of days ago. We did a quick a quick uh, trip up to this uh, battlefield here in Virginia called New Market Battlefield, and you get so excited when you get something happening. I mean, that's like you know, it's like oh my god, you know. So yeah. that has to it has to do something to the environment around you. So. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's an interesting way of looking at it, and it, it's just something yeah. that I've been I've been really kind of gravitating towards more and more. The more people I talk to, the more experiences I hear about, the more it's like, I think there's something to that. Tell me more about, um, obviously, you had that experience in that first house with the bright lights and your family's like, oh, it's probably a guardian angel. What other experiences did you have growing up, whether it be that house or the other that stand out to you? So in that one particular house, it seemed like a whole bunch of things happened. One of the, one of the things that kind of stands out to me is, you know, I tell people, and this probably isn't right, but I think I saw my mom's doppelganger. You know, I know a doppelganger is when you see yourself, but I saw what I thought was my mom, but it turns out it wasn't my mom. But anyways, the story goes, you know, it was uh, this back in the 70s. You know, we we played outside, sun up to sun down, and it was starting to be evening, and I was getting ready to come in the house, and, and uh, I knocked on our back door, and the door had a window on it with a curtain, and um, the curtain opened up, and my mom was standing there. Well, at least I thought it was my mom. And she had this like evil grin on her face, this big grin. And she just like, looked at me and was kind of laughing at me. It wouldn't open a door to let me in the house. And I don't, even, I don't even know why the door was locked. But she wouldn't open a door. And I was like freaking out. I'm like, you know, started crying. And I'm like, open the door, open sure. the door. And, you know, so then I ran around to the front door. The front door is locked. So then I came back around to the back door. And, you know, there was my mom wasn't in the window anymore. So I started knocking on the door again and all of a sudden my mom comes down and she, uh, or she comes to the door and opens the door and she's like, she goes, what is wrong? Why are you crying? And I'm like, I'm like, you were, you were standing in the window and you wouldn't open the door for me. And she goes, Don, she goes, I was upstairs in the bathroom. She goes, I heard you knocking, but I couldn't come down because I was up in the bathroom. I'm like, no way. I'm like, that's totally like, I was just blown away. I'm like, I'm like, mom, but you were standing in that door right there. Yeah. Plain as day. Yes. And it's funny too, because the other day, um, me and my mom were talking. I'm like, mom, you remember that time when I was a kid and, and, uh, and I thought I saw you, but you weren't there. She goes, yeah, I remember that. And you know, all that stuff. So we were, so we were talking about it recently and, and, uh, but yeah, so that, that was pretty compelling to actually have a, you know, a visual, another visual experience like that. Did you your know, mom or anybody else have any other any any doppelganger experiences? You know, my mom never did. I'll have to, that's a good question. I'll have to ask her if she ever had something happen herself. Now she was open to the idea of it, but I never asked her that specific question. But that's a good question. Um, 
but she, yeah, she remembered the event. She remembered uh, the different hot. She, you know, we talked about some of the stories back when I was a kid and she goes, yeah, I remember all that stuff happening and, and all that. So what do you make of the doppelganger thing? I mean, that, that to me is, is kind of a chilling one because in many, many cases, when someone has the doppelganger, a true doppelganger experience, not just, I was at the mall and saw somebody that looked like you, but like this in a setting where like there's not going to be another person there that looks like your mom it's either your mom or a doppelganger they always seem to kind of have this almost evilness to them i mean just the looks the there's yes. it, there's a nefariousness and maybe evil is overstating it but it's a it, it's a they know that you've just kind of discovered that they're not who you think they are and they're kind of cool with that <laughs> i mean that's kind of like the the look that people get out of a doppelganger and, and so that that's a kind of a whole different ball game of things i don't believe that that's necessarily like a residual energy thing i don't know that it's necessarily you know i mean it, 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 it's probably a conscious thing of some sort but what is it you know i don't know it's a good question i don't know is it i guess one possibility is are you projecting are you projecting outside of yourself you know like you know like the idea of like poltergeist, you know how they, mm -hmm. with a poltergeist activity, the idea that like a, a teenager, usually, you know, like a girl projects her energy to the environment and makes stuff move around. I don't know, is a doppelganger some form of that where you're, you know, are you under some kind of stress or is so, are you, is so, are you projecting something from outside of you? I guess that's one possibility. I guess another possibility is, is it some kind of, you know, bad spirit or demon type thing that's, mm -hmm you know that's that's you know is duplicating you and you know for some reason because you know they'll say a lot of times that if you know if you believe in demonic type things that they'll you know imitate your relatives and i guess potentially could imitate you you know the other the along the same lines it's kind of curious i've had this happen a lot in investigations is i'll hear i'll say something and and i'll catch evp that says exactly back what i said mm -hmm. you know so it's kind of weird like is something mocking you so is is a doppelganger that is is it like is that is something mocking you by looking like you, <laughs> you know, it, or yeah. is it something you're projecting from outside? I don't I don't know. It's it's I'd have to think more about it, but I mean, yeah, it's it's it, you know, I guess it could be you know, is it something in, internal we're projecting, or is it something external mocking us? you know, or whatever. So, I mean, what do you, do you have thoughts on it? I think a lot of times you got to kind of connect it to the environment where it's happening. And I mean, are there other pieces of evidence to point to something kind of mischievous? I, I don't want to say demonic, but just dark, you know, something that, that right. has more of a, a, a nefarious intent. And I, I suppose, you know, demonic could be, you know, one of the possibilities, you know, when you're looking for A, B, C, or D. But what was there anything in that environment that that ever made you? I mean, obviously, seeing something ghostly does kind of make one feel uncomfortable. But something that that did feel kind of dark beyond the doppelganger experience that you had there. No, as you mean with my, with my mom uh, in that environment, yeah, where you saw the doppelganger of your mom. Did you ever have any other experiences in that environment beyond this the doppelganger thing that that were? uncomfortable that we're feeling negative kind of scary kind of dark oh yeah yeah so that's that house was um that house is where i saw the light figure but sure. that wasn't that wasn't scary but there was other times in that house in that same house that i would hear like noises and stuff upstairs like there, there had to be something to that house where we stayed mm -hmm. in because so what it, what would happen is i'll just tell you a kind of a long-winded version real quick is yeah. I'll tell you a quick long with long winded version. <laughs> so my so my dad, he, my dad would love to go for car rides. My dad's actually he's passed away. He died in 1994. But he always had to go for these car rides that were just like they never really went anywhere. But he would just drive around forever and look at stuff and do this and do that. So eventually I got to an age where probably was too young to stay home. But it was the 1970s, you know, and they were like, ah, if you want to stay home, stay home, you know. So so eventually got to the point where I, did, I just got tired of going for the car rides. I'm like, my dad, you know, said like, hey, you know, you're old enough. You probably can stay home if you don't want to go. And so he let me stay home by myself. So I stay home by myself in this place. Well, they all went out for this car, these long car rides. And I would hear, I mean, I'd be downstairs in our living room. And, there, and my mom and dad's bedroom was up above our living room. And you could clearly hear footsteps and the bed was like, it sounded like somebody was jumping on the bed. And and I would go running up there to see what the heck was going on. And 
there would be nobody there and the noises would stop. I could get up there, the noises would stop. I come back downstairs to the living room and then I would hear the noises again. And it was just like funny. I remember at one point it got to be so loud that I actually got so afraid that we had a closet in like where our kitchen was, kind of the kitchen. Yeah, it was like a closet in the kitchen. I actually went in that closet and I stayed in that closet until they came home because I was so afraid of the noises because it was so loud. So yeah, so there was some scary stuff going on there, you know, as far as, you know, as far as other paranormal activity. <coughs> and it's interesting, you know, noises sometimes, we can look at it and go, well, it's just noises. But what is the intent with those noises? Is the intent to, you know, if you're making them, uh, I guess sometimes we assume that whoever is or whatever is making them is aware of the effect that it's having on the living around you. And if it's scaring a child, right. someone who is, you know, sane <laughs> wouldn't be like, yes, I'm freaking the hell out of this kid. Let's keep it going. Yeah. But then at the same point, I think we have to look at it too sometimes going, we always are kind of assuming and it's kind of like just the, the bit of narcissism that, you know, everybody has in them um, of just, you know, making it about us going, well, I heard this or I, I saw this or I experienced this. So it must have been directed at me. It makes me wonder how many times, though, they're just kind of going about their day and doing whatever they're doing. And they have no idea that we're able to hear them because maybe sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. And it just kind of comes and goes. And it's not like they're sitting there going, oh, I'm going to freak the hell out of this child by rust by doing whatever i'm doing maybe right. sometimes they are but it, it's it's hard to know i mean and it can be an, an indirect effect as well you know it, it's it's like if you know if you're an adult watching a horror movie in the living room and the kids are in bed and you know maybe this sounds a little bit too loud but your intent was never to freak out your children who are in bed but, right. but maybe a sound you know came through and they're like oh my god what was that it's like oh crap you're know, like i didn't i didn't mean to scare you i'm sorry you know that you just the normal thing. I mean, and then there's the version of I'm going to turn up the volume really loud and put Bluetooth speakers in your bedroom <laughs> under your pillow. Yeah. That's that's nefarious. So, I mean, you got to kind of look at it in in different perspectives of what, you know, what is the intent and the context of it, too? Yeah. And, you know, in this particular day. So, you know, I had heard the noises on different days, different, you know, different times in this particular day. It seemed like maybe it was a little more nefarious. It was kind of amping up, you know. It started out kind of you know, a little bit of noises, and I would go up and then come back down to more noises, and I would go back up and check again. And I guess for a kid, I was kind of brave. <laughs> he would sure. go up in the first place, but but uh, when I now that I'm thinking about it, but um, and then but it got louder and louder to the point where I was like, I was just I, I didn't go up anymore because I was too afraid. And then I got I hid out in the closet for a while. <laughs> so, sure. But uh, but that was that was that particular day. So that time it seemed like maybe it was ramping up. Where other days it might have been just hey, <clears throat> doing my business. But you know, the other thing I, I asked my mom about this. We don't know the history that where all this was taking place. This particular place we lived in was uh, it was actually a duplex. Um, so I don't know what the history was. If that you know if somebody had died in there or what the deal was. But um, and then but you know I've. Having said all that, pretty much everywhere I live, it seems like I've I have so experienced some kind of activity. Um, but that, you know, as a kid, that kind of really stood out, you know, as a, a lot of stuff going on. And the other thing that happened in that same place while we're talking about it is I used to hear my name called. Like, it sounded like from a distance. I'd hear, Don, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and I would think it was, I would swear it was my dad calling me. So I'd be upstairs and I'd run downstairs and I'm like, what do you want? And they, 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 my mom and dad would look dumbfounded. They're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, didn't you just call me? And they're like, no, <laughs> we didn't call you. So that would happen you know, quite a few times too. It wasn't necessarily scary, but I don't know if, I don't know if whatever was there, you know, was trying to reach out to me or, mm -hmm. or do, or maybe knew that I was going to be more sensitive to it. Um, or is it, you know, I don't know. But there, yeah, that particular place had a lot of activity going on. As you got older, and I know you said you'd moved a little bit, um, you get to the teenage years, the late uh, years after that. H how did things kind of transition? Is there any, I should ask this, is there, are there any stories we're, we're missing before we get into kind of where you got into the world of, of paranormal investigation? Um, in that, you know, between then and, uh, and the beginning, is there any other nuggets or experiences that you had in those teen years or anything like that, that we haven't covered? Now, you know, it kind of just went on, you know, pretty much, you know, consistently, like <clears throat> one of the things that we always experienced, you know, as I got older, 
and we used to kind of talk about this as a family a lot was we would smell roses, unexplained rose smell, like rose flowers. My grandpa, which is my dad's dad, we used to grow roses all the time. So we kind of got kind of had this family joke or family thing like, oh, there's grandpa's ghost again, because we would just all of a sudden get this really strong, very concentrated smell of roses. And in fact, one time uh, in the in the house where we had the pool table, uh, we uh, set up a little seance, probably like the early, probably my earliest ghost hunting experience. <laughs> we set up on a, a kitchen table, we put a little candle and it was me and my mom and my me and my mom, my dad, and my sisters, and we, we tried to reach out to see if it was Grandpa's spirit because we're like, we smell these roses so much, and, you know, and, and all these things. So we started doing a little, like a little seance around the table, and nothing really happened. We're kind of like, Grandpa Molnar, if it's you, can you blow the candle or stuff like that? Mm-hmm. So nothing happened, but it was, but that's the kind of family I had, and that kind of stuff just went on and on. You know, at the house with the pool table, you know, I would hear stuff on the stairs. It sounded like footsteps coming up the stairs. We had a dog. I had a dog one time. I remember the dog was sleeping with me and it like would look around the room and then put its head down like something had walked in my room and and all that kind of stuff. So so it seemed like I always had experiences at that house, too. And then even when I went off to college and and and, and all that stuff, I had experiences where I lived in college and all that. I don't know how much you want me to talk about that, but. Well, yeah, I mean, what what did you what happened when you got into college? Because obviously you had a childhood filled with experiences and then you kind of get to the age where you know you start to think about these things and go yes this really happened to me or you're kind of like i don't know if i believe you know it's a, a time of kind of reflection and you know it kind of re you know re uh, adjusting everything what was it like in college so pretty much it kind of continued you know depending where i lived um the one that stands out the most was my sophomore year in college as an undergraduate i lived in the house with some guys it was a. It was in Akron, Ohio. It was an older house. Um, I think early 1900s. It was built, but it was this big house, and it had a, you know, had a main staircase in the front, and then it had a little back staircase, service staircase, from the kitchen going up, and then there was a basement. And the basement really, really had a creepy feeling to it. Um, I don't know what the history was, as far as um, did anybody die or anything in the house, but several of us guy, several of us guys living in the house. There were six of us kind of all had experiences in this house. But one of the things I had was I had stayed, I had stayed up there during one of the breaks. It was like Christmas break and I had decided to go home later. So I was in this huge house by myself and I could clearly hear something coming up the stairs. It sounded like it came up like from the basement to the kitchen and then up the, up the back service stairs to the, to the second floor landing. And I remember getting up and going to look and there wasn't anything there. And I, you know, went back in my room and then heard a loud bang in the kitchen and it sounded like something was coming up the stairs again. So at this point I had like a, I had a, like a baseball bat kind of thing and I grabbed that thing and I thought for sure somebody broke in. Yeah. I'm like, somebody has to be in this house. Somebody has to be in this house. So I'm like, holy cow. I was like literally scared, but ready to ready to fight, you know? Sure. So I got my baseball bat and I went running to the stairs and there's nobody there. And then I went, so I'm like, what the hell? Made sure all the doors are locked, made sure the windows were, you know, there was nobody in and nobody had broken in and, and all these things. And then, um, and then I went back to the room and the more noises. So I finally just said, you know what? I am just going to go to sleep. And if there's anything here that's going to, that's physically going to come in here, it's going to have to come in and then we'll figure it out <laughs> once it's in my room, you know, sure. but I just finally went to sleep and then, uh, but yeah, but we ended up comparing uh, several of us guys end up comparing notes and they're like, Hey, did you hear the, I was here by myself and I heard these noises and the other guy's like, Oh yeah, my God, I heard that too. And mm-hmm. so a bunch of us had, uh, you know, different experiences in that house. Um, but yeah, I think it was, uh, I wish I would have been a ghost hunter back then, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Let me ask you this. I mean, you are in the medical field. You are a doctor. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. I'm an internal medicine doc. So I do, okay. uh, internal medicine is, uh, adult medicine from age 18 to the time people pass away. I do just hospital based medicine. So okay. I'm a, I, I'm a hospitalist. And mm-hmm. what that means is I just work in a hospital. So if you come in the hospital, I'll take care of you. But then when you get done, you discharge from the hospital and you go back to your family doctor or your primary doc. Mm-hmm. So I don't do any, I don't do any outpatient stuff. I just do all inpatient stuff and take care of people in the hospital. So yeah, that's sure. what I do. That wraps up part one of our conversation with Donald in part two. Has Don ever had any paranormal experiences in a hospital setting. And as a doctor, how has Donald been able to mesh the world of the paranormal with science?
was Donald able to communicate with a former colleague who had passed on at the hospital? And is every hospital haunted? And what is the belief system of most hospital staff on the topic of ghosts and paranormal? All that and more in part two of our conversation. To hear it, become a gravekeeper. That's a supporter of our program. Sign up to do so at patreon.com slash the grave talks. Go to our website, thegravetalks.com and click become a gravekeeper. Only $5 a month gets you access to every single one of our interviews in their entirety. Hundreds of them for you to binge away on. All of it commercial free. You also get advanced episodes of the show weeks before they're released to the public. Again, patreon.com slash the grave talks or go directly to our website, thegravetalks.com and click become a gravekeeper to get in on all of that and help keep our program on the air. Until next time for the grave talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening. <laughs>